somewhere. I don't know where because I, I suspect it's going to be a very large file size. Um, so we're going to try this out. I've never recorded a, a webinar before. Anyway, um, first I just want to thank you for making time to attend uh, to attend this webinar. Um, this is one of three uh, orientations that we're putting on to go over a whole host of different issues. Um, so we're going to, I have the uh, agenda up on the screen. Again, there's a chat box to the right. So if you can't see it or you can't hear me, um, uh, chat. Uh, I, I'm actually not at my computer, so I can't receive email right now. Um, and if there are any technical problems and you need to get caught up uh, later on, well, I'm recording the webinar, and I'll try, I'll try my best to, uh, to fill you in on anything that, that you missed, um, if, there, if there are any technical problems. Um, but uh, moving right along, um, it is fully my intention to be 100% done by 3 o'clock. Yesterday, we got done a few minutes early at MAPC, so um, we'll see. Uh, uh, we'll see, but, you know, we'll see if we get done early, but definitely we'll be done right at 3 o'clock. Um, before we get going, the, the one thing that I, I want to say is congratulations to everybody who uh, was awarded uh, a grant through the tr uh, Community Transit Grant Program process this year. You might have heard this was an incredibly competitive year. Um, we were only able to fund about 45% of all of our uh, grant requests, um, which is a steep departure. Last year, we were able to fund about 90% of what was requested. So we've really had to become much more selective, and it was a very challenging uh, grant review process this year. Um, so congratulations to you guys. Um, we're really looking forward to, to seeing these projects move forward, um, supporting you not only in um, fulfilling all of the requirements that we're going to be telling you about, but also just having a very successful project that's really going to change people's lives. Um, so with that, we're going to do just a quick round of introductions for those of us who are on this, <laughs> on this end of the line, um, because unfortunately, I would have to unmute you, and it would, there are a lot of people, and it would probably quickly get very um, chaotic. Um, but just to, uh, just to, again, introduce myself, Price Armstrong. I'm the uh, uh, Transit and Capital Analyst here in the Rail and Transit Division. You've probably emailed with me, talked with me on the phone. Uh, maybe you've met me in person, although in this digital age, I can't tell you how many times I meet somebody, I'm like, oh yeah, we've communicated for months and months. It's good to finally meet you. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Aniko. Aniko Lasla, I'm the Statewide Mobility Manager. Trevor Baird Murray, I'm the Transit Compliance Officer. And Greg Sapchinski, I am MassDOT's Title VI Specialist, and we should be joined in just a few minutes by John Lozada, the Manager of Federal Programs in the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. Okay. So, um, just to give you a quick snapshot, uh, you probably already know this, but the uh, orientation, our goals today are to go over all of the various federal and state requirements. Uh, to set the tone for the, for the webinar, uh, really what we want to go through is how can we support you as our sub-recipients to fulfill these requirements. Um, ultimately, these requirements are coming down from, uh, many of these requirements are coming down from the Fed, uh, from Federal Transit Authority, um, because we're receiving the money from them, and ultimately we, MassDOT, is on the hook to fulfill these requirements. Um, so we want to make sure that you guys have everything that you need in order to do what you need to do so that we can turn around when FTA does their triennial review or does any sort of audit and say, Yes, our subrecipients have been fulfilling the, you know, we've been ensuring compliance um, and our subrecipients have been fulfilling these obligations. Um, so we certainly don't want to intimidate you or make you feel overwhelmed by the, um, the, the requirements or, or the, the needs that we have in terms of reporting and documentation. We just want to lay everything out there and say, you know, we want to support you in making sure that you're able to do this. So, um, I'm going to start, oh, oh, sorry, and then, so that's one side of things, and then the other side, and this is something that some of you might already know, some of you might not, but I just want to show you where things are done in Grants Plus, our online grant management and uh, data management system. So with that, I'm going to hop over to you, Grants Plus. Um, you should have a login at this point. Um, if you don't and you need one, just let me know and I can set you up. Um, 
but uh, but if you submitted an application, you had to do it through Grants Plus. Uh, so I just logged into Grants Plus. This is uh, the Resources tab. I wanted to start by showing you um, where some really good resources are that I'm going to reference. I and others are going to reference throughout this training. So if you go to the Resources tab, actually I'll just I'll navigate there again. And I'll apologize in advance if things go, um, if things aren't as fast as they should be. Yesterday it was taking a little while um, to load some of the tabs, um, but you know it goes as quickly as it can. Anyway, there uh, while it's loading, I'll just I'll just say there are a series of um, there are a series of how-to guides that are located in the in the resources tab um, for RTAs. Uh, it's very typical. For me to get a phone call saying, you know, I need to make this project change. Okay, so this is the resources tab. I never use the organization library. I go directly to the global resources. But anyway, there's a um, there's a guide for, for example, how do you change a project if you, you know, don't need to use some amount of money, but you need to shift it elsewhere, or you um, applied for a new grant, a new federal grant, and received it, and you need to um, enter it into Grants Plus. Um, there's a guide for it. My, uh, if you email me, I, my immediate response is going to be, you know, have you seen the guide, have you used the guide, and then if you are still confused or still uh, need help, then, you know, feel free to let me know and I'll, I'll walk you through the process because I, I created most of these guides. So, um, right, so these are, these are all of the resources, uh, how to change a project in Grants Plus, how to submit an invoice, which that is, um, that's a very important one because I imagine that you guys want to want to get paid. Um, how to report milestones. This is the Title VI program development um, package that Greg is going to go into a little bit later on um, with some excellent resources to help you build your own build or improve or modify your own Title VI uh, program. Um, guide on how to request a title. And then we have a lot of links to online resources. Um, that again, we're going to go into later. But I know, I know later on, you guys are going to be scratching your heads at something or another and think like, you know, I feel like I knew that there was information on this. I would encourage you go to the resources tab and check out the global resources. Okay, so now we're going to. Oh, and I'm going to pull up the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Now I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, going to go into contracts and invoicing. Oh, actually, <laughs> I'm going to be doing a lot of flipping between windows. Um, so now I'm in the test page. This is all this sort of made up information where we uh, test out things, you know, if we, if we need to tweak how projects are changed or tweak how contracts are generated, et cetera. This is in the test page. So if I start messing around with things, don't worry. This is a test page. It won't actually impact your contract or your project list or invoices or anything like that. Um, so in terms of contracts, there is a contract tab. You aren't going to have all of these tabs because I'm a, a super admin. I get access to all sorts of things that, frankly, you should be thankful you don't have to deal with. So you just have contracts. Um, in terms of the uh, timeline, I should probably I should probably mention this. So as you know, we. Um, when we award our uh, 2016 Community Transit Grant Program awards, so this refers, uh, well, let me take a step back. We're awarding federal funding and state funding. The federal funding, we're actually awarding the 2015 apportionment. Uh, and the goal is to get the contracts prepared by July 1st and out the door so that we can start paying, uh, if it's an operating or mobility management, uh, project, you can start invoicing off of it as soon as the, the new state fiscal year begins. Uh, unfortunately, because we're using federal funding, um, we need to wait until the full apportionment has come out. And Congress, uh, the, the U.S. Congress is the body that does the full apportionment, the full federal apportionment. So the only reason that I point this out is because you might have been hearing about these transportation fund extensions that have been happening. So I think most recently it was uh, extended to July 31st. Uh, and this has to do with Congress fighting about how are we going to fund uh, the transportation bill. Um, 
but without getting into the politics, the, 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 the practical reality of it is that until we get the 100% through September 30th apportionment, we're not able to execute contracts because we don't know what the full, MassDOT doesn't know what the full amount is. We have the estimates and the amount that, um, that the feds are, are planning on uh, apportioning, but until it's actually been apportioned, MassDOT won't certify any of the contracts. So in terms of getting operating contracts out the door, I know many people who have operating, um, many people who have operating uh, projects want to start them, you know, as soon as they can. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get a contract to you. I, I mean, we don't know when. Congress could make the full apportionment tomorrow. Um, they could not make the full apportionment until August or September. And until the full apportionment comes in, um, we can't generate the contract. On a case-by-case -case basis, what we may be able to do, and you should contact me after the webinar if this is something you want to explore. Um, for, uh, for projects that are less than $250,000, we may be able to backdate the start date of the contract to July 1. So even if we don't send you the fully executed contract until August or September or, or uh, you know, October. I mean, who knows um, when Congress will come out with the full apportionment and we can get the contract generated. Um, um, right, we can send you the contract at that time, but then we can uh, backdate the, the contract to uh, July 1 so you can actually send us invoices for costs that you incurred, um, uh, you know, after July 1 instead of after like September or October. Um, so I, I, hope that, I hope that made sense. It's a little bit confusing. Uh, the, the long and the short of it is um, we, we want to get you your money just as much as you want to receive it and we want to get you your contracts just as much as you want to receive them. But right now we're being held up by the federal, uh, federal processes that are well outside of our control. Um, so with that said, oh, and in terms of questions, um, I'm going to direct you to the, um, to the, the chat uh, function um, on your, there should be like a, a like a, a, an interface to, to the right. Um, just feel free to type in any questions and send them my way. I'll, I'll be stopping periodically and we'll address any of these questions. And then at the end, we'll have, we'll have Q&A. Um, so. And, and just, you know, let me know if anything is confusing or, or whatever. Um, all right, so once you get into contracts, you're not going to see all of these different contracts. Again, this is because I have, um, I have the super admin view. Um, and the contracts are pretty, uh, let's see here, let me move this out of the way. Uh, the contracts are, are um, pretty straightforward. It's just what is the, um, what is the, the funding source and, the year you'll see the expiration date. Um, I'll pop into pop into this one. Um, this is one I was looking at yesterday, and really the contracts just show you the amount of money that um, that is in the is in the contract and the amount that has been invoiced. And again, since this is the test page, I'm not even sure if this is a real contract, and it's certainly not accurate if it is. Um, so, for example, this is South Shore Community Action Council for an operating assistance um, uh, award, and the total uh, amount was 249,000. Um, and then you can see some of the contract documents. When I when I clicked on this yesterday, I'm not even going to. Uh, I I just got an error message again because this is a test page. I don't think there's actually a contract attached to it. But if you wanted to see the contract, the fully executed contract, this is where you would click. Um, and so this is uh, this is where the uh, where the contract lives. And I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Yep, and you'll see some other projects, but because they aren't there, there's no check by them. Um, this is the only one that is active that you can actively invoice off of, which. Want to make sure, um, right? Invoicing. So I'll switch over to invoicing. Um, probably most of you have submitted invoices. Again, this is a very uh, important, important function um, for us and for you certainly. So on, on the contract tab, 
you'll see contract profile, and then you'll just click over into invoices. So this is where I was um, telling you, you'll see how much you've invoiced. Um, you see the total amount, 249000 and then the, uh, the total amount that's been invoiced. And just to be 100% clear, this is the total amount that has been invoiced and that MassDOT has accepted. When we receive an invoice before we accept it, we make sure that there are no errors, that all of the documentation is, is, um, is adequate and, uh, and that the, it's not missing anything. Um, and then once we've done that, then we'll actually accept the, the invoice. Until then, it's not actually reflected in the invoice amount. So you'll see that there are two pending, oh, I'm sorry, three pending invoices, um, which I'm going to be adding another one. This is, these are ones that I, I added recently while I was doing training. Um, but they aren't reflected in the total amount that's invoiced. Um, as soon as they were, uh, if they were accepted, then that would um, increase to whatever $95,000, $97,000, and the balance would be deducted um, uh, appropriately. So let's, uh, let's go through and add an invoice. Okay, so we'll start. Oh, and just so you know, I'm going to reiterate, there is a how-to guide in the resources tab. Um, so if you if you get stuck somewhere or you're like, oh, it's time for me to submit an invoice and I don't remember how to do that, check out the guide. Um, billing period. This is, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how you bill. Um, so you can bill quarterly, monthly. You probably don't want to do it more frequently than monthly, but if you need to, we can work with you on that. Um, if you want to do it semi-annually, uh, you know, the important thing from our perspective is all of the invoices have to be in by the um, by the end of the contract date. You know, if if the contract expires June 30th, 2016, you have to invoice by June 30th, 2016. Um, so we'll say that this invoice is for I think I've already submitted one for this time period, but it shouldn't matter. Um, May 1st through May 31st, and I'll just type this is a test invoice. Press save. Okay. And then this is an automatic invoice number that's generated by the system. Um, the next thing that you'll need to do is add receipt or other documentation information. Um, so, for example, if, uh, you know, if you're meeting payroll, so let's say you have a project coordinator and you're, you're requesting reimbursement for, um, for hours worked on the project, then it's not really a receipt. It would be, you know, like, like a, a pay stub, a timesheet, something like that. But, you know, this is just where you're listing the documentation that uh, comes along with your invoice. Um, so there's only one project on this. Agency reference ID, this is the um, internal, let's see if it says, I believe it says this in the, in the, um, in the how-to document, but this is like an internal number that you assign, I believe, to the, um, if it's a vendor or if it's an employee, you know, like 000, oops, let me, like if you had 0001 um, as the employee, then that would be, um, that would be the internal reference ID for that employee. Uh, date of service, and this is less important for us, more important for you and your own internal uh, record keeping, and then if there's an audit or something, we'll be able to easily match up this invoice with whatever internal documents you have. Uh, the date of service. So if this is um, the monthly timesheet, you can just put 531, vendor name, you know, Price Armstrong. Receipt amount. Um, let's say it's 80 hours at $10, $20 an hour, that would be $1,600. NASDAQ share, $800. Description, this is for services rendered. Uh, now, the reason I put NASDAQ share at $800 is because, um, keep in mind, operating assistance typically is um, reimbursed at 50%. So if, so if you've done, so if, um, the total cost is 1600 then you can request reimbursement for up to $800. Um, so press save. Uh, 
and then one of the important things is oh, and this is a glitch I think just in the um, just in the test page. I've been trying to get a result, but I haven't had time uh, to uh, to follow up with the vendor. Uh, for some reason, it's duplicating, and I don't know why. Um, but you can see the totals are fine. Uh, but you'll be, and then let's say that you had a receipt for supplies and a receipt for, um, I don't know, fuel or a per mileage reimbursement or something like that. Um, then you would just, you would just add more and more receipts. However many receipts, individual things you're requesting reimbursement for, you add that many receipts. And then we need the actual documentation, the timesheets, the invoice numbers from your, from your vendors, any other documentation, and this would be, you know, May invoice documentation. You can select the document. Um, let's see here. It doesn't really matter what the document is. This one will be fine. Um, uh, sorry, it does matter for the purposes of this training. It doesn't matter what the document is. Um, one thing, though, to keep in mind is that the uh, when you're submitting receipts, don't submit, like when you're scanning in receipts, it's best to scan them in all as one file. So you can have like 15 receipts in one PDF file. That way you're just uploading one file and not 15 files. Similarly, we are downloading one file and not 15 different files. So it's easier for you and it's easier for us. Um, so press save with the... Um, invoice documents, and then, you, you know, again, you may need to add more receipts or uh, the key is when thinking about the level of detail on this, uh, on this invoice, I mean, we, we provide a lot of flexibility. We don't want to, we're cognizant of the fact that we don't want you spending a huge amount of time putting together the invoices. However, um, we do need sufficient documentation so that when we are audited by the feds, uh, we'll be able to demonstrate with a lot of transparency and clarity, um, you know, this is what we were reimbursing for. It was related to the project for this reason. So like, for example, a signed timesheet with, um, with the person's name and hours worked, uh, that would be sufficient to um, put along with this invoice. Anyway, once it's all put together, you uh, press submit. Are you sure you'd like to submit this invoice? That it asks this question because once you've submitted the invoice, there's no taking it back. Um, it's not at all uncommon for somebody to hit submit and then be like, oh, shucks, I forgot whatever, and, I, and then calling or emailing us um, to already to get the invoice back. So press OK. And then the uh, invoice is submitted. <clears throat> and once the invoice is accepted, you'll see it. Uh, you'll see its status change to accepted back on that uh, invoices tab. Um, and then eventually, uh, I think it's typically within 30 days, um, we we try to make payment. Um, so uh, that is the process for invoicing. Um, all right, moving. And if, again, if you have any questions, just feel free to hit them in the chat section. All right, so moving down to milestone reporting, <clears throat> which is convenient because this also is in the contracts tab. I'll just point this out. Milestone reports, uh, Onico, my colleague Onico is going to go into um, the kind of information that we want in milestone reports, the frequency, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> I'm just going to show you how to add milestone reports. So actually, I'm going to go ahead and delete this one that I did yesterday, and I'll add it anew, fourth quarter. So milestone reports, we use them for a couple of reasons. One is um, to make sure, oh, yeah, uh, just to give you an idea of what we use them for. Uh, one is to make sure that a project is on track to be spent down when, uh, you know, by the end of the contract. Uh, it's really... Um, Frustrating, certainly for you, but also for us, if there's a remaining balance by the end of the contract. Um, we don't get extra points uh, for, you know, unfinished projects that leave money on the table. So we want to know early, um, 
we want to know as early as possible uh, if there's some problem with completing the project and figure out how to support you to actually complete your project or if that's not possible, um, how to reallocate the money. Um, so uh, it's very important when you're doing the milestone reports, choose the appropriate state fiscal year <clears throat> because when um, Trevor, our compliance officer, uh, generates these reports from Grants Plus. If you if you choose the wrong fiscal year, your uh, milestone report will not be included. Fourth quarter, so we're going to pretend that this one is, even though the fourth quarter of 2015 is not quite done yet. And then um, all is on track for this um, report, or whatever the information is that you need to submit, which again, Annika will go into shortly. And then you just hit save. <clears throat> and if there are any documents that you need to attach, um, I, I can't think of one right now, but if there were a document, then you would do that here. Uh, then you hit submit, and voila, it has been submitted. There's the uh, 2015 fourth quarter milestone report. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Aniko to, there we go, talk a little bit more about milestones. Okay, milestones reporting. So whether you are the, a first time or multiple time recipient of state and federal transportation funding, you know that reporting is a really important function that really provides feedback about not just whether the funds are spent, but how those funds are spent. We simply have to make sure that those federal and state dollars are spent judiciously according to federal and state laws and also according to your project proposal. Now, uh, on this slide, we put uh, a couple of performance measures based on the category in which you received the funding, so 5310 capital and MAP. Those of you who in previous years, let's say, received MAP vehicles, you still remember, or you have it because you have to report it that way uh, to us. Uh, we have about 12 questions uh, in three different categories. We were asking about passenger description, whether the number of people you uh, transport are elderly and ambulatory riders or non-ambulatory or non-elderly. And also we were asking about the purpose of the trip, whether it was for shopping, for medical trips, or whatever else. Uh, we came together and thought that uh, let's make sure that we keep those performance measures alive and uh, we would like you to report on those that are related to operations. And those are perhaps for us the most important ones. By all means, I do not want to discourage you not to uh, collect those uh, data points I was just referring to earlier, but going forward and by the time these you will receive these vehicles, which will be next year in June sometime, if I am correct about that, these, uh, the performance measures you see there, you need to be reporting on. And by then, we will have this function automated in Grants Plus, so once you provide those performance measures on, uh, you, you report those to us on a quarterly basis, uh, you will be able to input that, those into Grants Plus. Now, uh, as you see on the left side, uh, we will require a couple of data points. Reporting period, the VIN number of the vehicle, which is the vehicle identification number, and the automated reading for the reporting period. Now, as I said, you have to submit these quarterly but if you received a vehicle, we need those data. If you keep collecting those definitely monthly, we would like to see in that bucket, and you will see on, on your screen, if you are reporting for the first quarter of the year, you will see January, February, March in there. So the, the data points that you report on, let's say, the vehicle passenger, uh, the unlinked passenger trips and vehicle revenue miles and hours and so on and so forth, those need to be on a monthly basis, but you need to report those four times a year. Now, the other thing uh, we'd like you to do is to report those measures according to, so by operator. That means if somebody has received 10 vehicles and those 10 vehicles are operated by two uh, providers, we would like 
the by op these performance measures reported by operator. Let's say if one operates five vehicles and the other one operates another five vehicle, the vehicle revenue hour or vehicle revenue mile needs to be totaled across the five vehicles by operator. And we also, the last one here is the number of road calls for mechanical failure. And again, this is not for the collection of all your vehicles, but vehicle by vehicle when it happens. The performance measures or the milestones, I would say, uh, for operating mobility management and research projects would be a little bit different than what I was just describing to you. And Abril and myself already started to contact uh, most of you who have these other types of grants to discuss the work plan, what needs to go into that work plan uh, in terms of milestones and also what makes, uh, uh, you know, makes sense in terms of uh, performance measures. And those milestone, milestone reports need to be uploaded uh, once every quarter. Uh, so this is on 53 and operating mobility and research. And the next slide will show that your reporting requirement is quarterly. Uh, those are both milestones for those of you receiving 5339 and 5311F. So I think that concludes the reporting section. Okay, and uh, let's see, I had a couple of questions. I'll just go through. Let's see here. Um, all right, first question, will we be sending out the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, I'll be sending out a follow-up email and I will attach the uh, PowerPoint presentation as a reference. And then the uh, second question is, um, will, uh, let me go back to that slide, will these take the place of the paper reports? Yes, eventually. But yeah. for now, uh, Paula, for, for all of your vehicles, uh, please report the way you have been reporting. Yeah, so uh, basically we, we want to create a new interface in Grants Plus to do all the, the vehicle reporting that Anika went over. Um, and uh, the hope is the vehicles that we just awarded will be arriving about a year from now. And um, the intention is a year from now we will have that reporting function in place. Uh, until then, just keep doing what you're doing in terms of the paper report. All right, so uh, I'm going to go over service requirements now. I, I think I've, I won't spend a whole lot of time on some of these because I, we really hammered them in during the application trainings. Um, but for people who receive 5310 MAP vehicles or are doing uh, MAP, 5310 MAP projects, a uh, couple of things. One is you must serve, the target populations must be seniors, and that's 60 and over, age 60 and over and people with disabilities of any age. So uh, just to touch on that again, uh, the example that I use is there was a municipality that um, the Council on Aging denied service to a person with a disability who was not a senior. And so the complaint um, eventually found its way to us. I, I don't know what the, uh, what the process was prior to that. Um, and so then we needed, we forwarded it on to the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. And so then they got back in touch with the person who complained and had to work with the Council on Aging. Anyway, uh, and ultimately, when you look in the terms and conditions uh, attached to the contract that, um, that you sign, needing to serve people with disabilities of any age and seniors is part of the, it's part of the deal. And this is as per federal regulation. So what that means sort of on the ground, you know, let's say that Council on Aging uh, provided a uh, trip to, from a senior center to a shopping center on Thursday afternoons, and a person with, this, with a disability, um, oh, and they charge $2 for that trip. A person with a disability uh, said, oh, hey, I actually would like to use that same service. Um, then the Council on Aging needs to uh, provide service to that person with a disability if that is a 5310 or uh, slash MAP funded vehicle. Um, it doesn't mean that the Council on Aging has to provide service different from what it provides to uh, seniors that use the service. It just means that it needs to be open to seniors and people with disabilities of any age. Uh, and if you have any questions on that, I know we're going to go into um, Title VI and the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
um, and other compliance issues a little bit later on. Um, but if there are any questions on that, you know, feel free to, to contact me and I'll, I or someone else will do their, their best to answer that. But we just want to avoid, we want to avoid any problematic situations because it's, it's certainly a headache for, for us and for you and, you know, very, uh, definitely a headache, you know, definitely a, uh, a, a problem in a person's life if they're denied service when they should have been provided service. Um, Another issue, and this is also with uh, any federally funded vehicle, is no charter service is allowed. So, you know, it's a, it's a vehicle that's funded with public monies. And the service that's provided with that vehicle has to be open to the public. No, um, you know, golf trips on the weekends to people who rent out the, the vans. Uh, and for operating projects, you probably already know this, but hammer at home again, it has to be above and beyond ADA. Um, the operating projects cannot fund uh, uh, complementary fixed route ADA service. All right, so I'm going to let Aniko take it away with the authorized vehicle use guide. Okay, so continuing along what Price just said, uh, hopefully for those of you who received vehicles in previous years, this authorized vehicle use guide is nothing new. But what we did this year, not long ago, a couple of weeks ago, is we updated this guide with those questions we have received over time. And those questions mostly are related to the allowed or incidental use of the vehicle. So the first tremendously long URL will take you to our Grants Plus page. And if you click on it, I think people will be able yeah, to click on it. No, no not okay. right now, but okay. you know, when they just pull up your presentation and they will be able to click on it, right? And okay, so oh, that take, takes, takes uh, uh, you to, to, the, to the page, to the Grants Plus page and to the, the, uh, the, the vehicle guide. And what we updated the guide with is a series of questions, as I said, I, we received about incidental use. Now, incidental use of a 5310 or a MAP vehicle refers to any service provided to the general public in a way that does not interfere with or otherwise limit services provided to the primary beneficiaries according to the terms of con and conditions of the contract you signed with MassDOT, pretty much what, what Price said. But uh, combining the required and the incidental use of vehicles, uh, we believe that allows for better resource allocation, more efficient utilization, and reduced operating costs via coordination equipment and population. So in the second URL, what you see takes you to the Mobility Management Website Information Hub. And actually what I created is a quick two-pager and a, uh, including a table that really gives you a glance of the questions and short answers of what we have received over time. So once you click on it, you will have a, uh, you know, a quick overview of what are the allowed uses and incidental, not, not the allowed, but recommended and incidental uses. And if you uh, need details on that, please go back to the first URL, which is the, the full authorized vehicle use guide because uh, it, the questions are there and also the detailed answers are there. Okay, so that takes us back and again to the coordination aspect and the regional coordinating councils. So coordination and efficient resource allocation and utilization will remain priority for MassDOT Mass DOT in the way it will award grants. This is what we did this year. So the focus areas in grant awarding uh, were expressed in the questions you had to answer in the application. One area was unmet needs assessment, uh, quite frankly, how well you are aware of the unmet needs and unfulfilled service in your service area. The second one was, and how, how well your proposal responded to that, collaboration, who are your partners in collaboration, and uh, thirdly, performance measurement. What we would like to encourage those of you who are not part of the regional coordinating councils is to join one and work with the local and regional providers to find out where those unmet needs are and how to design services to, to, to best respond to the, to the region's unmet needs. Now we have on our website, again, this is quite long, but you will find the regional coordinating councils contact information and meeting times and venue on the website 
and please contact those people and uh, join the conversation. In many areas, it happens once every month. In some areas, uh, a little bit uh, less frequently than that, but nevertheless, all of our coordinating councils are doing an incredible job in terms of bringing, uh, you know, uh, to light the understanding uh, of a region. So that's about RCC. Okay, let's move from there. All right, but I just want to, before we move on, I just want to go to the website. So actually, let me go to the transit page. So just to let you guys know where these resources are, there's the Community Transit Grant Program and then uh, the Massachusetts Mobility Management Center. Uh, if you go to uh, this is mobility management, ah, here we go. If you go to the uh, program information page, that's where you'll find the uh, authorized vehicle use guide um, that Anika referenced. And it has a lot of good information, including the brand new questions. frequently asked questions. Uh, and then under uh, information sure on, the first one. Maybe. this is where you'll see all of the um, incidental use of se uh, so this is the incidental use uh, sheet that uh, Anika put together and where was oh and where are the RCC it's programs and services it's a little bit buried uh, RC regional coordinating council there we go and RCC regions and contact there we go. And, and I, oh, next, sorry, next week on, we will have a nice map, so you don't have to go all the way down here to, to find your RCC, but the map will be up front and personal, and you just click on your region, and you will get this information, what you see here. And I, I'll, I'll just underscore that I already mentioned this, is the, this was an incredibly competitive uh, grant application process. Um, one of the things that we looked at, which this is a relatively new um, uh, criterion for uh, scoring applications was coordination and collaboration. And so I strongly encourage you, and we're going to strongly encourage anyone who wants to apply next year, get involved with the RCCs because it's going to be very, it's going to be a very important consideration, I suspect, um, for when we uh, score the applications for next year. Um, all right, so with that said, let me go back and up. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, compliance. Um, uh, MassDOT, as you know, is a state administrative agency. Uh, we must have the requisite technical capacity to receive and administer federal funds, and we must have sufficient staffing resources necessary to carry out those responsibilities in accordance with FTA requirements. Every three years, the FTA comes and visits us, and they conduct what they call a state management review. It lasts from two to three days. And in that review, the FTA takes a look at how we administer our programs and spends a great deal of time determining how successful we are with our oversight. That is, how we take a look at our subrecipients to see how they're progressing in their management of their programs. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about our compliance from a very, very broad perspective. But I'm going to be referencing <clears throat> occasionally the compliance and performance review document, which will be administered as part of our site visits to you folks. Um, just as, a, as, a, as an assurance, I, I want to make it very clear that a lot of these questions are particular to this funding source and are all relative to the sorts of questions that the FTA expects that we ask our subrecipients. So in other words, this isn't a, a wild goose chase. A lot of the issues that we're going to go over today are, in fact, uh, mandatory. The FTA makes sure that we, we address them with our subrecipients. So if you could just bear that in mind as we progress to this, this, these few uh, 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 slides, that'd be great. So next. Uh, so there are six phases to the actual compliance monitoring um, the site visit. Uh, there's going to be a desk review. There's going to be um, uh, some preparation between between us and you folks. There's going to be a, the actual site visit, and then there's going to be a draft and a final report based on our site visit. I'm going to go over the specifics of the actual site visit in about four or five slides, uh, but just note that uh, you will be c contacted several weeks before the site visit, and you will be given a document to, to review, which we will base our site visit on. So you're going to get you, you're going to get plenty of plenty of uh, uh, advance notice um, about the site visit coming up. There are three primary areas uh, for the compliance review. There's the uh, administration and management portion. There's the operations 
and service portion, and then there's the planning and marketing components. Um, briefly, I'm going to deal with each of these sections. Uh, for the administration and management components, uh, we focus on project management, grant administration, financial management, procurement, DBE, and EEO. DBE is Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, and EEO is the Equal uh, Employment Opportunities Act, which will be dressed separately by our, by our colleagues from the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. But generally, with respect to the project management, grant administration, and financial management components, the sort of questions we, look for, we ask, information we look for, We'll deal with the organization structure, the sort of training you're providing your employees, uh, in-kind contributions, indirect costs, and for procurement, if you, indeed you do any procurement, uh, many of you will not, most of you will not, in fact, uh, what we're going to be looking for are the, the processes you follow, as well as the information you keep on those procurement transactions. Um, for the third uh, uh, section, the operations and services section, we focus on asset management and the uh, ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Again, this is part of our, uh, part of, this falls within the purview of the, uh, of the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights, and again, they're going to speak to it a little bit later. As to the asset management, uh, this is a, a hugely important area. The, feds, the federal government is increasingly focusing on this area. There's going to be some significant changes and developments, I've been told, within the next 16 months. It may not apply to you, given the time frame, but uh, you should definitely put an asterisk next to the asset management, especially as I, uh, as I review it in the next couple of slides. Finally, the third area is the planning and marketing section. Uh, and in this section, take a look at the, uh, the Civil Rights Act uh, and making sure that the, the appropriate notices are placed um, um, and whether or not the program has been followed and you have a Title VI, VI plan in place. So those are the three areas. The actual compliance side visit uh, for, for most of you and I say most of you because I know there are some rural RTAs on the phone. Um, so this, uh, this is going to be a, a, a little bit more time consuming for those. I hate to say this, Paula, but uh, because you are a bigger, bigger organization um, and you're a nicer person, we're going to spend a lot more time with you um, on the islands. But for, the, for everybody else, the, uh, the, the smaller um, subrecipients, expect a half-day site visit. Um, Note that 65% of you, at least, will be visited as part of this compliance review because we are mandated to reach that number by our 2016 state management review. Um, uh, and again, as the, uh, with respect to the site visit time frame, you're going to receive an assessment package, which essentially is the, the actual uh, site review document, uh, six weeks prior to the site visit. And you'll have two weeks once you receive the document to respond to us. We'll conduct a desk review and then we'll be in touch. And then we'll form our uh, site visit and come out and visit you based on those responses. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a document that we've had out for, for at least in the 5310 funding area for, for a couple of months now. We've, we've conducted a couple of site visits. They've gone smoothly, and our sub-recipients uh, remain on speaking terms with us after those site visits. So um, I think it's been a successful, successful process all around. Uh, the other thing I wanted to remind, and I sort of, I sort of skipped over this uh, unintentionally, there are three real objectives to the compliance process, and I want to make, make this clear. The first is, the, is to obviously ensure federal and state regulatory compliance. The second is to promote good practices. So if we see some, some novel and very good approaches to how you folks are running your, your, uh, your services, we'd like to make a note of that and, and, and you know, let the FCA know, know about this also. Conversely, um, if we recognize that there are some weaknesses in, in uh, program administration, we're going to uh, do our best to provide you with whatever additional technical assistance uh, you may find necessary, uh, we may find necessary. So it's a, it's, a, it's a mutual conversation, and it's about educating, it's about educating everybody at the table. So uh, with that said, I'm going to go on to the A133 audits. Uh, very briefly, uh, we are required to ensure that subrecipients meeting the single audit threshold, which is uh, the, the, um, the receipt of over $750,000 or more in federal funds in a fiscal year, or the expenditure of, of $500,000 in that same fiscal year, that they have to conduct um, an independent audit uh, in accordance with 2 CFR Part 200. I reference 2 CFR Part 200 because it's a relatively new law, went into effect December 26, 2014, 
and it is a uh, it, it's a consolidation of eight, eight existing circulars, including OMB's A133. Essentially, what they've done is they've upped the ante with respect to the threshold, and they've clarified when the reports are due. Um, and as you can see, you see that the A133 reports are due 30 days after the receipt of a single audit, or nine months uh, at the end of your uh, at the end of your fiscal year. Uh, for those of you out there who are smaller organizations but are part of towns or municipalities, it is likely that this will apply to you, uh, because likely towns will, will may well have received more than 750,000 in federal rewards in total within a fiscal year. So I would I would strongly encourage you to contact your your um, the town administrator's office to determine whether or not an A133 document has been filed. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a situation uh, involving a town where one has not been filed. So it's not really a question of if, it's a question of where you can locate it and whether or not you can be comfortable enough in response uh, acknowledging that, that an audit has taken place. Um, asset management. Um, again, I've taken this out, this is part of the compliance review. Um, I've taken this out sort of to, to focus separately on this because as I said, uh, this is becoming an increasingly uh, focused area for the FTA. Uh, and for the federal government generally, there's a lot of assets out there, um, not just with the, for transportation purposes, but for homeland security purposes. And Congress in the past couple of years is, is well aware that there are a lot of, there's an awful lot of money and an awful lot of assets out there. And so their interest is, 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 has been renewed to make sure that these assets are being, are, are being maintained uh, for the future. Um, there are three areas uh, that we're, we're going to focus in on asset management. The first is the satisfactory continuing control. Second is equipment, and the third is, is vehicle maintenance. Uh, and taking again each of these categories individually, um, uh, the general rule is grantees must have written plans for FTA and state funded equipment and facilities, and must maintain FTA and state funded equipment and facilities at a high level of cleanliness, safety, and mechanical soundness. So when we go out there uh, as part of our site, site visit, or if the FTA was decided to go out there and visit you individually, they will actually take a look at the, at the physical condition of these assets, uh, from the facilities and the garages to the buses, and they'll, and they'll check for cleanliness, they'll check for safety, and they'll check for mechanical soundness. Second, uh, satisfactory continuing control. Uh, grantees must obtain prior written approval from NAS MASDOT before selling, leasing, or disposing of vehicles, equipment, or facilities. So if there's, um, if, if you've got to make sure that you keep us well aware of your intentions with respect to these assets, because as, as according to the feds, it's, a, um, it's an indication of how well we and you are running your organization. Uh, and third area, equipment. Uh, grantees must use FTA and standard funded equipment and facilities to provide public transportation. There's no, there's no that's, not a, uh, that's not a very difficult question to ask. Um, but that's the standard rule. Grantees must carry comprehensive collision uh, insurance and FTA and safe funded buses. And we will also, when we're out there, for those of you who have spare vehicles, we're going to take a look and determine whether or, no, or not those, those the number of spare vehicles is appropriate to the size and age of the fleet, the amount of peak demand, as well as the projected ridership growth. Vehicle maintenance. Um, this has been an issue with one or two of our site visits so far. And again, this is an area that we're going to focus in on. When we come out, we're going to take a look at uh, who's responsible for, for the vehicle maintenance, uh, um, um, what preventative maintenance schedules are being followed, uh, how well organized they are, who's, who's the author, who's responsible for, for organizing it, what is the standard of, uh, of preventative maintenance being used, is it the manufacturer's minimum, is it your own? Um, if it is your own, I want to caution you that it's got to it's got to be uh, it's got to meet the minimum uh, manufacturer's minimum at, at the at the very least. And I would also caution you to make sure that if you choose to have your own preventative maintenance schedule, please stick with that schedule. Because if it appears from our review that there's a, there's somewhat there's, that the maintenance schedule is somewhat confusing as to the dates and timelines involved. And we're not able to tell whether or not the manufacturer's schedule is being followed or the institution's own internal schedule, that will be a finding, I'm afraid. So if you're going to focus again on, on one or the other, choose one and just keep it, keep it, um, keep it consistent. Uh, and then the fourth category is how well are the, the, 
the maintenance schedule is being maintained. Um, we're going to actually randomly choose one or two vehicles or one vehicle. We're going to take a look at the, the schedule. We're going to um, we're going to follow through based on the VIN number um, uh, what what sort of maintenance this vehicle has has, has uh, undertaken. Uh, Pre-trip inspections are also areas that we take a look at. Uh, they should be conducted prior to service. We would like to know what, what they address and what the deficiencies are, how they were noticed, and how timely uh, that response was. For warranty issues, um, again, we're going to look at, at um, um, uh, the organization's ability to follow through on any warranty issues that they may have discovered. Um, according to the FDA, an aggressive warranty recovery program ensures that the cost of defects is borne properly by the equipment manufacturer and not the subrecipient, the state and the FTA. There should be clear procedures to identify warranty repairs, record the warranty claim and submit the claim to the manufacturer and follow up on, on unpaid claims. I take it from that, from that piece of information that the federal government has in the past had to uh, un unnecessarily borne the cost of repair for vehicles that were within warranty when in fact they should have, uh, it, that cost should have fallen on the manufacturers. So again, warranty issues, uh, how they're dealt with, we're also going to be taking a look at. And I think that's it with respect to the compliance part, as well as the asset management part. Yep. I think I'm going to hand over. Oh. Yep, and that's me. Okay. Um, so this position, uh, for those of you who received vehicles, many of you already know this, um, but there's a threshold at which point um, the federal government and MassDOT no longer has an interest in the vehicle. Uh, that's the point at which you can sell it, junk it, scrap it, what, whatever it is, uh, keep on using it, um, you know, whatever it is. But at that point, you can uh, request the, vehicle, uh, the title from us, and we'll remove MassDOT as the first lien holder and send it your way. Uh, let me go to the program information and you'll see on the fully accessible vehicle guide the different thresholds so for example for a type A it's four years or a hundred thousand miles for a type E it's five years or a hundred thousand miles whichever comes first so this is the uh, this is the standard that we use I know that that the FTA has a much more complicated um, standard but uh, for the purposes of simplifying it a little bit, we use it just whatever is listed here. Um, so once a vehicle becomes, let's go back to the test page, once a vehicle becomes um, uh, eligible for release, uh, you can go into Grants Plus, uh, once it becomes eligible for being disposed of, uh, you'll request the, the vehicle title from us. And this is all done through um, through Mass uh, through the Grants Plus page. Let me find a um, a good. Let's see. Uh, yesterday I found a good one. Just a second. Okay. I can't remember what organization this was. Ah, South Shore Elder Services. Again, I'm not sure. I, I don't know how accurate this fleet inventory is. But um, all right, let's let's imagine that this vehicle has um, has hit its useful life based on mileage, for example. This is a Type E2 van, so that'd be 100,000 miles. You just click into the record. Oh, and uh, I forgot to mention this. Once uh, a vehicle has met its threshold based on age, obviously we don't know the mileage until you until you enter it. Um, but we do know how old the vehicle is you'll see a little flag pop up next to the vehicle record. So from our perspective, if you have little flags uh, next to vehicles that are active with a mass on lean on them, go ahead and request the title. There's, we don't particularly like having titles on file that are past their useful life. Um, and that gives you the freedom to, again, to sell or, or junk or whatever uh, the vehicle um, as, as you see fit. So anyway, going back to that title record, um, once you have hit the useful life on it, you'll hit release, and oh, that's right. I remember there was an issue yesterday. Oh, I shouldn't have done this one. 
All right, let me let me try and find one more, and then I'll if I can't find a uh, a record that I can I can fly through. Uh, let's try. Let's try this one. Then I'll just explain to you uh, without actually doing it. All right, release. Okay. All right. Well. Again, there's a user guide on how to do this. I'm not going to take up any more time trying to ferret out a title. This, this actually, this title, I, I remember this record. Um, it was actually in, uh, accidentally released in this uh, uh, in, in the test page, so I can't I can't go through and do the actual release process. But basically, you'll just you'll say, oh, this is a um, this is a, uh, you know, it's, it's met its useful life. You'll enter the final vehicle mileage, and then you'll submit it to us. Uh, once you've submitted the, the, uh, the release request, it usually takes, uh, I'd give it 10 business days for us to process the release request, um, and, uh, and then we'll send the title to you. Uh, sometimes it can take longer. Occasionally we need to request the title from the RMV, um, but, uh, but most often it's, you know, it, it, it hits your mailbox within, I don't know, two weeks or so. So that's the, um, <laughs> that's an abbreviated version of the title release process. <laughs> and uh, let me go, let me switch back to my own. And again, in the resources tab is the step-by-step uh, -step how to release, uh, request a title for release um, using the, uh, the guide. Again, I'm going to say uh, if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat section. Uh, I'm not seeing any just yet, um, which I'll take that as a good sign. Uh, and left. <laughs> or you guys are all playing Candy Crush. <laughs> That's the other possibility. <laughs> just kidding. All right, so we're going to move on to driver training. Um, Annika will take that over. Okay. So. Uh as uh, Trevor was talking about the importance of vehicle maintenance, we have to make sure definitely that the vehicles are safe and sound mechanically, but also that they are operated uh, safely. So that requires the drivers, whoever drives those 5310 and MAP vehicles, to go through several courses and pass those courses to be able to operate legally those vehicles. There are seven requirements and under federal and state law for those who operate these vehicles, passenger assistance training, defensive driving training, accessible lift use and secure wheelchair securement because many of these passengers will be people with disabilities. There will be a course on disability awareness and the ADA that was passed in 1990. There is a drug and alcohol awareness and safety course and there is CPR and first aid. Uh, in the third column, you will see the frequency, how often the driver has to take these courses and repeat the courses, and the duration of hours. Now, for those of you who operate in rural areas, MORTAP, which is the Massachusetts Rural Transit Assistance Program, allows you to take those courses, especially the five, first five, via MARTAP, and MASS.com contracted with a national company, RLS, that provides driver training throughout Massachusetts and, again, to, to rural RTAs and, let's say, councils and aging that operate in rural areas. All you have to do is contact the person uh, on this slide, Carol Telly. There is a website. There is a, an email and also two phone numbers to, uh, to go and register your uh, driver to take those trainings. CPR and first aid are not offered under MARTAP. However, those courses are offered just about anywhere in the state and in your locality. So that's about driver training. Okay. Moving on down. And we are on Title VI compliance. That is Greg. Let's give them a Yeah. Yeah, good idea. So we're about to shift gears to the civil rights related content of the training or the orientation. So if there's any remaining questions about what we've covered so far, now might be a good time to plug them into the chat uh, because I have to take it just a moment here to get some of the other visual aids up. So that will take me just a moment. Yeah, sure. Access the files. It might take a little while to download. So, okay, here. Here. 
Well, so I was just going to uh, uh, show people what I'm what I'm doing here on Grants Plus. Again, as Price mentioned, and there's a number of valuable resources under the Resources tab, and you see here a few few items down is the 2015 Title VI Program Development um, zip file. Um, and as that opens up, that's where I can uh, now start uh, directing you to some of the resources that we're hoping will guide you through your Title VI Program Development process. I don't know if you had some. No, no, no. I just was going to fill in while you were uh, fiddling. <laughs> okay. Um, so it is downloading. It is taking a little bit of time, but that's okay. In the meantime, I can do something else. I'm just pulling up, uh, as you can see, FTA's Title VI circular um, for reference. And the first hit here on Google is the right reference for any of you who are interested. It's 4702.1b. That's the current FTA Title VI circular. And we still have the presentation here as well. So I, I, I'm, there's a lot of familiarity at this point among all of you about uh, Title VI requirements, which is what we'll be talking about first. So I don't want to uh, um, you know, spend too much time necessarily doing any background or, or context information there. But you know, we're talking about uh, your organizations now receiving either for the first time or on an ongoing basis, federal financial assistance. And Title VI, which is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, is a cornerstone piece of federal, uh, federal law, federal non-discrimination law, that um, uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, and national origin in any program receiving federal financial assistance, which all of you now are. Um, I should note that uh, national origin, since the creation of Title VI, national origin has been interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court to include language access. Uh, so you'll often hear when people are talking about Title VI obligations, they'll talk about translations and interpreters and uh, things like that. So that's all wrapped up in these Title VI obligations um, uh, backed up by this federal non-discrimination law. Um, you do see the, the text of the law there up on the screen just for reference. Um, but I don't think that we need to spend too much time on that. So when MassDOT is undergoing the efforts to comply with Title VI, to d develop a you know, framework, kind of a programmatic framework for complying with Title VI, uh, we're required to develop Title VI programs. These are kind of soup to nuts uh, documents that describe um, the activities of the organizations and where the Title VI implications are in those activities. Uh, as well as satisfying the kind of list of required program components as established, in this case, by FTA. What you see up on the screen here is actually a, a quote pulled directly from FTA's Title VI circular addressing how sub-recipients, organizations like yourselves, should go about the process of developing your own Title VI programs. And the recommendation or the encouragement or the option presented to sub-recipients by FTA themselves is look to your primary recipient's program as a model. Look to it to adopt whatever components you can uh, or build off of it and simply move forward that way. Build off of the work that we've done, that MassDOT has done, uh, and use it for your own purposes. Uh, and you actually see there a list of some of the things that it is that we've developed that FTA is suggesting you can go ahead and simply grab right from our work and use for your own purposes. The notice to beneficiaries, complaint procedures and forms, public participation plan, language access plan, and so on. So um, what I can bring up here, if I switch over to the browser, you can see I'm just going to do a search for MassDOT Civil Rights. That's the easiest way uh, to bring up our webpage, the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights webpage. And it's a little slow at the moment, but that's OK. You can see over on the uh, uh, left-hand side of your screen is a uh, link to Title VI. And there we have our FTA program. And of course, since we're dealing with FTA funds, that's the one we're interested in. And I'm pulling this up on the screen just to show you we have all of our program elements available to anybody who wants to see it, any member of the public, any subrecipient. It's all up on the website. Um, so this can certainly be referenced and, and you know, consulted by you as you go about building your programs. But of course, all of this is posted as PDFs, so you can't necessarily go in and, and access any of it in terms of you know editing files and things like that. So that's why, ah, 
So you can put that X yeah. there. I think it should be okay. Download it. Okay. okay. So what we went ahead and did with creating this zip file in Grants Plus, which I'm now going to try and open, was give you a um, a single directory that has Word versions of all of those Title VI uh, program elements of ours so that you can grab them and edit them and use them for your own purposes. Um, and I should note before I go farther, we, we've done a lot of development of this program specifically just in the last uh, few months and, 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 and let's say a year. Um, it was submitted to FTA in 2014 um, uh, and has a lot of you know, new components, updated components, components that uh, have been approved by FTA. Uh, and so for any of you who are familiar with some of our older programs, our older program for FTA from a few years ago, the, you'll definitely see significant um, improvements and changes and growth. Uh, uh, so certainly, you know, uh, we encourage you to reference this as the kind of latest, greatest, best practice in this area. Um, so the first thing that you see here is uh, a Word file right at kind of the, the top level of what was downloaded, and then there's a folder. I'm going to open up this Word file, and you have to forgive me for just a moment because I'm going to do a little bit of switching between screens. Hopefully that is opening. The reason I said I have to switch between screens is because I actually want to go back and reference this FTA Title VI circular, which I brought up on the screen. This, of course, is FTA's controlling document around Title VI program requirements. And I'm just going to quickly direct your attention to Appendix A, which should start right somewhere around here. Here we go. Appendix A in FTA's Title VI circular is a checklist. It's a checklist of program components. And for the purposes of the 5310 program, this very first list of requirements, general requirements as articulated in Chapter 3, is what we're interested in. The additional requirements you can see are for fixed root providers, and then some additional requirements on top of that for fixed root providers of a particular size. Those, simply, those requirements don't come into play for, for the 5310 program, even if some of your organizations are fixed group providers and are fixed group providers of that size. We're not interested in those requirements as it relates to your 5310 fund management and administration. So we're only interested in this, this top portion of the checklist, the general requirements under Chapter 3. So the reason I said I have to jump back and forth a little bit is you can see what, what, what I've done in the other Word document that I opened up is I've taken this entire list of requirements and I've copied and pasted it right into oops. Okay. Copied and pasted it right into this Word document. And so each checkbox as you see on the screen is is just a, a, a repeat of FTA's requirements as uh, articulated in the circular. And all I've done is go through and articulate the steps that you should follow to meet that requirement. Uh, it's really supposed to be your roadmap about you know exactly what to do to satisfy the building the, the, the need to build your own Title VI program. Um, you'll see reference here obviously to this download mass dots template as kind of the first instruction in a number of these requirements. And that of course is just a reference back to going to Grants Plus going to the Resources tab, downloading that zip file with the Title VI program components, and using that as your starting point. Because then, as you'll see, you have, oh, would that be a, where would that zip file, ah, here. When you go into the actual folder, so the, the Word document is just this, this checklist that's open on the screen now, this annotated checklist. When you go into the actual folder, you start seeing the different program elements, like the notice to the public. And in fact, for something like this, we have the English language version available as a Word file, which I can open up. It might take a moment here, but so, so here you go. It's a perfect example of what we're aiming for, a Word version of our program components that have been FTA approved that you can simply go in and rather than referencing Mass DOT, you could plug in your organization's name, and that then becomes your notice to beneficiaries. And you'll see the same kind of thing rather than referencing 
MassDOT's Title VI specialist as a point of contact for additional information or complaint filing. You can plug in your organization's contact information. So it's really kind of plug and play for you, uh, and you have the, the, the confidence in knowing that it's been federally approved and is uh, available for use. Um, we should also maybe go back. Let's, let's see if this is probably the easiest way. For something like the notice to beneficiaries, since we consider that to be a vital document, and I would say all of your organizations should consider it to be a vital document as well, for our purposes, we've gone ahead and translated it into the top 10 languages that, uh, that we've identified in the Commonwealth, identified through you know, census analysis and, and, and surveying of the population and so on. Um, so we've gone ahead and made all of those translations available to you as well. Uh, you can see here we have a Haitian Creole version and available for your use if you'd be interested. If, if, if you have the need for that kind of uh, language coverage within your service area, feel free to make use of the documents. All, again, all you'd have to do is, uh, you know, plug in your organization in a translated way, of course, you know, ideally by a professional translator, uh, right into those documents, and they're all good to go. I mean, some of the, some of the organizational stuff is relatively, straight, relatively straightforward. Right. So you can probably do it without a professional person, but if you have any discomfort sure. or don't have anybody who you really trust to sort of make sure the translation is accurate and double check, then maybe use somebody who's a little bit piece work. Sure. So let me go back actually to the PowerPoint just to make sure we're not skipping over anything. As you'll see, there's a link here right to that FTA circular, the document that I brought up in Google. It's, uh, there's a link to it right from the PowerPoint, so feel free to uh, to use that. Um, so on the next slide here is a link directly to our FTA Title VI program. So if you don't want to uh, search for it through Google or do a, a, a you know click a couple of links from the Mass.Homepage, homepage, you can use this link to go to it directly. Uh, and this is just reiterating: our program is available for use. Those components are FTA approved. You should feel confident using them. They just need some minor modifications, as we've identified. Uh, and use that kind of checklist that we provided as your roadmap. Um, there are a couple of issues here that I did want to bring to your attention. Uh, oh, and actually, before I get into this, I should mention um, some of you are uh, not only receiving 5310 funds or otherwise uh, state managed FTA funds uh, through Mass DOT, but you also receive FTA funds directly from FTA, which means you're already uh, maintaining a Title VI program that you're reporting directly to FTA. So we're not suggesting that you need to create another Title VI program or a standalone Title VI program just for your state-managed FTA funds. Um, for those of you who already have a program, uh, please let us, uh, you know, essentially inform us of that fact through the process of responding to this requirement through this grant cycle. All of you are going to have to submit a Title VI program as part of this, uh, this effort by August 1st. So for those of you who already have it, your report can simply consist of, we already have a, a Title VI program by virtue of the fact that we're direct uh, recipients from FTA. Here's a link to it. Here's a copy of it. Um, but the one thing I would recommend is you can still look to our program elements as models, as best practices, and if you're uh, contemplating any updates to your titles, to your own existing Title VI programs, you can certainly see, you know, what we've done for a public participation plan, what we've done for language access plan, and you can start to build your own program that's going directly to FTA with some of those elements. So it can still be useful to you, even if it's just uh, letting us know that you already have something in place. It's, it, in that context, you the program should be approved by FTA. Right, right. Um, so uh, let me, if it's not too confusing for anybody, I'll do a little bit of switching back and forth here again. You can see the first issue that we're bringing up here is complaint handling. And as you can see on the checklist, one of the, a, a number of those uh, primary components that we're looking for in a Title VI program is a complaint procedure and related complaint forms. And even beyond that, we're looking for see where it is here. Uh, there's a log of complaints that you're also required to submit. Ah, here we go. The, the next one on the list, the list of transit-related investigations, complaints, and lawsuits. So you can see three requirements having to do specifically with complaint handling around discrimination complaints, around Title VI complaints. So as with all the rest of these Title VI program components, feel free to use our complaint procedures, our complaint forms, our complaint log template, 
as your model. You can incorporate all of it into your into your program directly and work right from it. Um, the recommendation that I wanted to highlight here in the in the presentation is feel free to use MassDOT to use the Rail and Transit Division to use the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights as a check-in as a first point of contact if and when you receive Title VI complaints. Uh, we know that not all of you have, you know, robust staff, and not all of you have a lot of staff time that you could devote to processing a complaint, handling a complaint, um, and we certainly want all of these complaints to be handled appropriately. So if you uh, uh, receive something, a letter, an email, a phone call, a voicemail, that sounds like somebody might be alleging some kind of discrimination occurred, and you just want to make sure it gets handled properly, check in with us, you know, phone call to Trevor, phone call to Price, email to myself, or whatever works. Um, uh, we will certainly, you know, help you uh, process the issue, uh, give you some some pointers on, um, you know, what your next steps are, um, and we, we're certainly in a position to take some of that, uh, you know, burden of processing the complaint off of your shoulders. Um, there's also this next element here refers to some Title VI program elements that are a report of a previous year's activities. So you can see, going back to the checklist. Something like, you know, a list of transit-related Title VI investigations, complaints, and lawsuits, or uh, a summary of outreach efforts made since the last Title VI program submission. All of those are backwards-looking requirements. They would assume that you've been doing work that's Title VI compliant and logging it for the last year, two years, three years, however many years you've been receiving federal funds. Now, for those of you who are receiving federal funds for the first time, obviously you don't have those kinds of records yet. You don't, you don't necessarily have that backwards looking log of this type of information yet. We fully acknowledge that. We're not expecting you to you know, try to recreate it from things that you can piece together or anything like that, but simply acknowledge in your August uh, 1st submission to us that uh, starting now we will be maintaining a log of complaints. Starting now we'll be maintaining a log of our a summary of our outreach efforts so that as you apply for subsequent uh, grant cycles, uh, and, and receive FTA funds into successive years, you're going to meet that, you know, that, that retroactive look going forward. Uh, let's see. Also, uh, I, I, I'm hesitant to keep switching back and forth between the documents, but you'll see another requirement to report on the demographics of committee and council membership. This is for uh, uh, such entities that, you know, uh, uh, groups that you uh, convene within your organization um, uh, that are that are non-elected and the membership is picked directly by the organization. Uh, this only relates to transit-related committees or boards or councils or groups. Um, so if that doesn't meet the definition of any of the groups that you convene on a regular basis, if you don't have, if the focus of those groups isn't transit, providing transit service, coordinating transit dollars, what have you, uh, then we're not interested in the demographics of those boards, uh, of those groups, uh, only the transit-related work. Um, you'll also see, uh, as you go through some of our guidance documents and some of the requirements, the need to develop a language access plan. This is the kind of steps that you're going to take to meet this language access obligation that I discussed as a part of national origin discrimination. As you dive into the materials, whether it's MassDOT's language access plan that you're referencing as a model, or you go directly to the FTA circular, you'll see reference to this safe harbor provision. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, FTA articulated the safe harbor uh, approach to language access in their uh, circular, in their Title VI circular, as one approach that recipients and subrecipients can take to meet this obligation. It essentially says, um, Based on a study of the demographics of your service area, if you know that there are some some language groups, some limited English speaking, uh, uh, limited English proficient speaking language groups, in your service area, that exceed five percent of the population or one thousand people, then you're going to go ahead and translate proactively all vital materials into those languages that exceeded those thresholds, and by doing so, you're demonstrating that you're complying with this obligation. This is just one recommendation that FTA made about how you can comply with uh, LEP obligations. It's not a requirement. It's not the only way that you can comply. Um, but essentially, as an organization developing a Title VI program, you need to decide, are we going to take the safe harbor approach, or are we going to try to articulate some other approach 
that fits our needs better, better that fits the needs of our of our uh, 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 you know constituents better, fits the needs of riders better. Um, and any decision that you make one way or another, simply articulate that to us in this October, uh, uh, August 1st report. If you want to say we are following Safe Harbor and here's our language access plan to support that, that's great. If you want to uh, take MassDOT's approach and say we're doing something a little bit different than Safe Harbor, um, feel free to do that. Just articulate it, document it, show us uh, why you've come to the determinations you've come to, uh, and we'll review it and get back to you. Um, the next bullet here on the list, there are likely other organizations within your service area that have some of this Title VI related information already at their disposal. Uh, for instance, if you're, you know, a Council on Aging within an RTA service area, that RTA likely has a Title VI program uh, and the kind of, you know, demographic data that supports it. So they'd have a demographic profile for their service area where they look into what language groups are present. Um, uh, so you can certainly uh, reach out to any of those types of organizations, uh, and I'm sure that they'd be willing to provide you with some information, provide you with some guidance, um, and collaborate on a more, you know, regional look at your Title VI needs right in that area. Uh, same thing, you know, MPOs that, were, that are covering your region, they'd also have this type of information. So if you don't already have a relationship with them, um, now might be a good time to forge that kind of relationship. Um, and lastly, uh, this is an obligation, Title VI is an obligation that cross-cuts all of your activities uh, and, and all of your staff need to be aware of the obligations, all of your you know, drivers, seasonal drivers, uh, anybody coming on board onto the team doing the work around, uh, around transit as part of your organizations needs to be aware of these obligations and uh, uh, you know, any, any work that you need to do to you know, train staff, to disseminate you know, policies among staff, um, uh, that's all you know, reportable moments, that's all something we'd like to know about, uh, and it's certainly something that we can, we can support if need be uh, as you move forward. Um, I think we're now shifting into our ADA portion. I don't see any questions that popped up uh, during this Title VI segment, so I think we can move right into that. Okay. Yeah. Um, All right. I don't know, Price, if you wanted to address those comments before we want to. No, I already, I already, I already. Um, I think this is a new yeah, one. A new one. I think so. Ah, uh, okay. Let's take a look. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Brand new one. Uh, this is shifting back to title request. Does a request? For a title, serve as requesting permission from MassDOT to dispose of a vehicle. Uh, so, if it's a vehicle that was awarded through the Community Transit Grant Program, that is, if it is a vehicle in which MassDOT is listed as the first lien holder, then you would request uh, you would request the title through Grants Plus. Obviously, if we're not listed as a the first lien holder, we don't hold the title. Um, so we we have no say in whether or not you dispose of the vehicle. Um, it's, it's only for the, uh, I think, just the fully accessible vans um, that, uh, that we hold the, the first lien on and that we have the title in our file. Those are the ones that you would request through Grants Plus. Okay. And I'm going to turn it over to John. Okay. Uh, just just the one slide. There's, there's a Oh, click on the slide. There you go. Oops. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll make this quick, folks. You've been patient and with us for a little while. And this, just frankly, you're going to be getting the more detailed training for your drivers who are really the critical point of contact in this work uh, separately. But this is like a moment to just give you from a more leadership perspective some of the high level considerations around ADA that are important to note. Both MassDOT and each of you as grantees are subject to the Americans, Disabilities, Americans with Disabilities Act, whether you're Title II, is, which is referenced above, relates to state and local government, some of which some of you might be connected to state and local government, so you'd be subject to that. And then other entities that are private, nonprofit organizations in the group, or for-profit businesses, if we've got any in that, in that, uh, of, of that nature in this group. Uh, would be subject to Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which speaks to 
places of public accommodation or private entities, as I referenced it above. Bottom line is that in either instance, we can't discriminate against individuals with disabilities in providing a transportation service. And some general considerations that you know, we need to provide people with the notice of their rights, and that's similar to the language that Greg already referenced uh, with respect to uh, giving people their Title VI notices, um, including the right to complain. Responding to complaints, and we've talked about that a little bit already. I think one of the pieces that Greg maybe didn't touch on as much um, we oftentimes find informal way to re ways to resolve matters before they become complaints. So that's one of the reasons that we also encourage checking in. I mean, that's kind of one of those awkward moments when somebody's complaining about something that you're trying to just do the right way and you're not sure which way to kind of play it. But I think it's, the checking in gives us a chance to figure out, you know, if there are any options short of kind of processing an investigation or something like that that we can do. So. From, from your leadership perspective, really making sure that there's an, a responsiveness when those matters come forward. That's really kind of the stewardship we're expecting from everybody. Um, we talk about the concept of ensuring equivalent service, not 100% equal. Certainly, you know, when you think about a person who's trying to get into a vehicle who might be mobility impaired, then it's going to take a little longer for that person to kind of get into the vehicle and get to the place that they were going. That's not as much of an issue as where maybe the driver says, well, you know, that person always takes so long, so maybe I'll just get there a little later, or I don't know what. Yeah, those become those moments where we're not dealing with equivalent service. You're really making a person go through an extra travail, and that's something that we really want to avoid as much as possible. In terms of the documents and communications that we share, we need to be able to make brochures, applications, handbooks, bulletins available in alternative formats, but only upon request. I mean, there's some rules of thumb that we suggest. Uh, it's always good to have something in like a 16 font print handy in case somebody shows up. I mean, there's more specialized kinds of uses uh, for people in Braille and other kinds of ways that people sometimes use uh, third party uh, relay uh, phone systems and what have you, and those kinds of methodologies can, will sort of show themselves up as we're going along. But essentially, if you have a, something that's sort of already in a larger print, that might be a, a good thing to just sort of have on hand. Um, when we went through this cycle last year, we had a little bit of a complication around this concept of service animals, where previously uh, the Mass Office on Disability and the uh, Commission Against Discrimination were wrestling about whether companion animals qualified uh, as service animals. And the conclusion uh, through a recent MCAD decision is that we're sticking with the concept of only allowing service animals, which is consistent with federal law. And by that, we mean dogs and those miniature, miniature horses, I believe that they have, but we don't see that as often. But, but, but dogs that are identified as service animals certainly qualify. Um, and then finally, you know, good stewardship also speaks to making sure that, you know, the service that we're, we're providing works and, and is really ensuring the kind of compliance that we're, we're talking about in this disability area. So if you do get a complaint and, and we're able to resolve it, you know, maybe at some point writing the service with the person who's providing it or just keeping an eye out would be a way to kind of just let the public know as well as letting the uh, individual who might have complained know that we, we care and that, we're, and that we're really sort of doubling back. So I think that that's another thing that we can sort of you know, just pull into, pull into our, our toolbox as a, as a resource to make sure the thing works. And then finally, on this, on this slide, again, the ADA is going to require, has very specific requirements for vehicles and facility accessibility, and you're going to provide a training on that. So we won't belabor that for today. And finally, I'm going to just touch very quickly on equal employment opportunity. And this one, unless you have 50 or more transit-related employees, and receive capital or operating assistance of in excess of a million dollars, or receive planning assistance in excess of in excess of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It's really I can't envision anybody in this peer group um, sort of provide, having those kinds of, of uh, requirements. Then you'd be for you'd be compelled to have an EEO plan, which is essentially a study of the universe of employee of, of, of census-based employee. Uh, potential employees who could qualify for the kinds of jobs that you fill. And it's a more complicated analysis than what I've just sort of suggested, but I think at this point, I'm not going to really belabor this. I, I just don't see how that's going to come up. And if it did, please reach out to us and we'll, and we'll follow up. Okay? 
And if you did have a plan, you'd have an EEO officer designation. And as I had referenced, you would do an anal underutilization analysis to see where the census data and the people that you have in different categories on the jobs would sort of match up or not match up in terms of need to do recruitment and other kinds of steps to uh, increase the diversity of your workforce. So I believe that's it. And we're not going to skip that. Okay. Uh, thank you much. So I'm not seeing if I can grab that mouse back. Thank you. Um, so I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, and since I see no more quests, oops, let me see here. Let me go back to the PowerPoint presentation. Since I see no more questions, um, I'm just going to finish up by saying uh, I will send out an email with this slideshow attached. And if there are any questions from uh, any other, um, we have one more presentation in Springfield tomorrow. And if there are any unresolved questions, I might send out uh, the answers to those questions when I send out the follow-up email probably sometime next week. Um, otherwise, feel free to reach out to me if you have any uh, any questions, and I will do my best to get the answer. Again, oh, we're done a few minutes early, so I kept my promise. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. It should be fairly nice until possibly thunderstorms this afternoon, so grab an umbrella. Um, uh, finally, I'm going to, I, as I mentioned, I recorded this, so I'm going to try and figure out if there's a way I can post this, and I'll let you know uh, if that's the case. So with that, every Everybody, again, thank you much. Uh, take care. To hear from you at some point in the near future. Bye bye.